My name is Josh Stacker, and I'm going to be moderating this event today, which is going to look at the Arab Spring and the prospects for democracy uh, in the wider region. Um, uh, while we were supposed to be talking about the wider region, there's been a little bit of uh, a rare consensus among the panelists that we're going to talk mainly about Egypt. Um, so I'll be here mainly to kind of push them to kind of look beyond Egypt to see if what we can find out. But you know, as everybody's comfortable, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out on a um, very beautiful and cloudless day here in Williamsburg. And on behalf of the um, Center for Strategic uh, International Studies as well as uh, the Williamsburg Forum, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, as by way of sort of, before I introduce everybody, I just had a couple quick things I wanted to go over in a way of like framing the uprisings, um, just because I know that we're dealing with a more general audience than um, what we're used to be dealing with. So if we think about the uprisings and the regional revolutionary activity that's taken place in the Middle East, which began in December of 2010, um, you know, it, it, it really has roots. And while the focus of this conference and this workshop have really been about Egypt, um, Egypt wasn't the first country to go through this. Many would say it was Tunisia that started this. But, you know, if you push back a little bit further, many would say that Iran also had an uprising in 2009. So we're dealing with a wider dynamic here. And um, so how do we understand what's happened and what continues to unfold in this region? Um, many social scientists, and I'm a political scientist, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just, it's there. Um, we could focus on, and many of my colleagues have decided to focus on, many of the grievances that animated the protesters. So a lot of social scientists are trying to operationalize concepts like dignity, or they're spending a lot of time looking at how people organize in protest tactics. Um, many are starting to look at the role of information technology, social media sites, and how that helps overcome a collective action problem. Um, but I'm a sort of more old-fashioned uh, social scientist. I believe that the social and political structures under which a society is forced to operate tell us a lot more about uh, explaining a situation um, because it helps us explain what's changed, what hasn't changed, what's, you know, there's continuity. And so um, rather than look at these very, uh, you know, interesting aspects, I'd rather focus um, on what I feel are the three sort of key factors that help us explain um, what has been dubbed in the United States, uh, for better or for worse, the Arab Spring. Uh, and one, it seems that uh, countries that don't have uh, resource wealth, this seems to play a factor uh, in whether or not you experienced an uprising or a revolution. Countries where uh, there's a kinship tie that binds people, that seems to be a factor. And then thirdly, the degree of one's stateness, right? So this is an old concept that goes back to the 60s in political science, and it's how much of a functioning modern state do you actually have? And so if we bear those three factors in mind, uh, and we talk about sort of 18 Arab cases plus Iran, that leaves us with 19 cases that we can think about. And if we bind the time period from 2009 to 2013, what we're looking at is out of these 18 cases, four leaders have been changed in Tunisia, Egypt, um, Libya and Yemen, mm -hmm. um, and if you parse that out further, three of those leadership changes were really popularly inspired regime changes, whereas one was a foreign inspired regime change, and I'm speaking about the case of Liberty because there, uh, Libya because there was outside uh, Western infer interference in helping bringing down the Qaddafi regime. And then beyond those four leadership changes, you had three more violent confrontations take place in Syria, Iran, and Bahrain, okay? So out of 19 cases, we've had seven uprisings. Four have led to leadership changes. There are 15 cases where the incumbent remains an uninterrupted uh, in, the, in its line of who rules the country, right? So just to give you an idea of the countries that we're talking about, um, Algeria, Bahrain, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, uh, Mauritania, Morocco, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Syria, and the United Arab Emirates, 
right? So if we think about it in these ways, right, we can start kind of framing what has happened in terms of uprisings and changes. Now these aren't stagnant regimes. The ones that, that, that have experienced leadership change and the ones that haven't, none of them are stagnant regimes. All are ongoing reforms. Uh, and at, at this stage, what we can really tell from those three factors that I brought out is that if you're a non-oil rich state, this is a sufficient condition for you to have an uprising. Um, if you're a non-oil non rich state and you combine that with a non-kinship based network in your state, that can lead to a, a real explosion, right? So that is where we see Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, Yemen doesn't fit that one, but uh, many would argue that uh, Yemen has more of a, a quasi-state in terms of how it functions with kinship ties, right? So that seems to be, from a social science point of view, the mixture that it ignites these things. Um, now, just one more quick, really, point of, of introduction. You know, it's become very fashionable for people to ask one another in Egypt, in, in Tunisia, in Yemen, in the United States, uh, particularly if you follow these things closely, where were you during the revolution, right? It's been also very fashionable to say, did the revolution succeed or did it fail? Um, and I don't know that we're really at a point where we should talk about these events in the past tense. Um, we're not watching the outcome of a process, we're watching a process, right? There is no formal ending. Uh, and what we see is the continuation of a social struggle that has deep roots before January 2011 and that are keep, gonna keep unfolding. The revolution isn't over and there is no um, repressing uh, one's way out of it unless the elites of these various countries decide they wanna take their countries down very dark paths. Um, and so I think that if I can invite you um, to entertain the idea or think about what we're watching as a historical process unfold, I think it's a much better analytically way of thinking about it than if we think about it as an outcome. Um, and then, you know, lastly, to frame the struggle, you know, um, social science has largely had this, you know, age old debate, the chicken under the egg debate in social sciences do structures matter or does agency matter, right? And what I'm trying to say is that what we're watching is we're watching the interplay of agency and structure, and that's why it's unpredictable, and that's why it's so dramatic when we see it. Because political elites, um, it's debatable whether political science is a science, but there is one law, and that's incumbents do not give up power, okay? So incumbents are going to try to design a structure or a politics that favors their incumbency. And, um, Agency is the beauty that makes this overrun these structures. And so what we're actually watching is a bunch of mini outcomes that just reframe the struggle going forward. So in, in, in the spirit of those comments, um, you know, I, that's where I kind of decided to frame this discussion. And uh, we are joined today by a very illustrious panel. Um, on my far right is Dr. Amr Hamzawi. He's a former member of parliament. Uh, he uh, has a PhD from the Free University of Berlin. Uh, he used to teach at uh, the Cairo University. He used to be uh, working for the Carnegie International Endowment for Peace in Washington, D.C. between 2005 and 2009. Uh, he now is at the Public Policy School at the American University in Cairo. And uh, he's someone that I've known for a very long time. I think we met in the Berlin in, in October of 2000. So uh, he's well qualified to talk about um, what's going on in Egypt. To my immediate right is uh, Dr. Sami Ateya, and he is a member of the Freedom and Justice Party, which is the, uh, the separate but affiliated party of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, he's a member of the Foreign Relations Committee and is in charge of the International Cooperation uh, uh, Coordinator. Uh, he uh, uh, has a, a PhD in management, and um, uh, so he'll be speaking in for a moment from that point of view. To my left is Dr. Manar Shalbagi, uh, who I also know for a um, long time. She is a, an associate professor of political science at the American University in Cairo, where I got my master's degree many moons ago. 
um, and she uh, is a specialist actually on American politics and has transitioned into also writing about Egyptian politics now. Um, she <coughs> served uh, at a very high level, I can't remember the formal title, and the constituent assembly uh, that drafted the Constitution, um, but she resigned from that uh, assembly uh, over the, uh, a lack of consensus on some issues. Um, so she's someone that is, uh, again, very plugged into the system in Egypt and, and will bring, you know, fantastic perspectives. She was my deputy. Offended? She was my deputy. Oh, big it? Okay, there we yeah. go. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, last but certainly not least, mm -hmm. Dr. Ahmed Darag, uh, who is also from the Freedom and Justice Party. He's also the Secretary General of the Foreign Relations Committee inside that. He used to be the Secretary General of the Government of Giza for the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Um, he has a, uh, 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 he was educated at Cairo University in engineering. He has a PhD from Purdue University, which is one of the top engineering schools in this country. Um, and uh, so he'll be speaking at us from a sort of more senior level uh, membership of the, uh, of the uh, Freedom and Justice Party. So without any more further ado, I'd like to kind of uh, give each panelist about eight minutes, uh, maybe five to eight minutes, uh, to kind of give some sort of opening statement and then um, I will cherry pick what they say and try to put them on the spot and make them feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and after about 40 minutes or so, we're going to be collecting questions from the audience and I will try to manage those, collect those and sort of, uh, you know, find a way to get your voices to, to ask the participants directly about what your specific concerns are. Dr. Hamza, would you like to begin? Sure. Okay. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Williamsburg, and thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, as you rightly uh, mentioned, on a cloudless, uh, very pleasant day. Thank you very much for coming. And let me, let me start by sharing an experience with, which I recently had in, in Egypt, uh, to, be, uh, to be specific, in the city of Alexandria. Uh, on Monday, two days ago, I was in Alexandria giving a lecture at the University of Alexandria, uh, a relatively good crowd of students, uh, female and male students, and quite diverse in terms of their uh, political outlook and in terms of their ideological uh, preferences. And the one common question which they kept raising and in, in, in increasingly critical manner is, are you satisfied with what you politicians are doing? <laughs> Two days later, earlier today, in, uh, in one of the sessions which we had in our uh, conference, uh, organized by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, some politicians, including myself, were pushed and pressured by entrepreneurs, by uh, <laughs> investors, uh, in fact, raising the very same question, just like students in Alexandria. Are you satisfied with what you are delivering as politicians, government and opposition alike? Well, uh, facing the same question uh, in Alexandria and in Williamsburg, facing the same question uh, raised and put forward by students and by uh, a different uh, crowd uh, in Williamsburg means that that is definitely one of the key realities we are looking at in Egypt of 2013. And let me start by saying that two years after uh, the revolution, and I continue to term it a revolution, not an uprising, of January 2011, Egyptian politics has not delivered to meet people's demands. People uh, in Egypt, or at least broad segments of our population, took out to the street to uh, demand dignity, social justice, and freedom, an end to human rights violations, an end to limits and restrictions on freedom of expression, and uh, a space for them to articulate um, their demands and to hold, to be able to hold public officials, elected and appointed public officials accountable. Two years later, politics has not brought Egypt or has not brought Egyptians closer to those demands, and therefore, one of the key realities we are looking at is a growing disenchantment with politics. And we can, we can see it in numbers. Uh, if you compare the voter turnout 
in uh, the parliamentary elections of 2011, uh, or the presidential elections of 2012 to the last voter turnout in the constitutional referendum of 2012, we have a drop from around 50% to around 30%. So a 20% loss in voter turnout, and that is definitely a reflection of the growing disenchantment with politics. Secondly, why, why are Egyptians increasingly disenchanted with politics? Let me, let me um, name three major factors. Factor one is the very fact that politics and politicians have been primarily preoccupied with high politics and have ignored to a great extent the day-to-day -day management of politics and the day-to-day -day management of politics in a way which would address and tackle and uh, uh, account for people's needs. We have discussed for a very long time issues pertaining to the Constitution. That is a Muslim Brotherhood-driven conspiracy to stop my argument uh, on this enchantment. Because the second point would have been uh, that the ruling party is responsible primarily. No, I'm joking. So, um, <laughs> well, uh, politics has failed in, in, in the sense of addressing social and economic uh, needs in uh, moving beyond high politics and moving beyond debates on constitutional issues, uh, how to get our legislative uh, institutions democratically legitimated and so on and so forth, and to, to, to bridge um, uh, um, the gap between high politics and local politics. And that is definitely one reason for the disenchantment. Mm -hmm. Secondly, a second factor is the growing ungovernability of Egypt. Egypt is in, 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 a, in a severe social and economic crisis. Uh, if you look at major indicators with regard to economic and social issues, the country is in a crisis. And you cannot, you cannot ask people to, uh, to be patient with politicians if they see their country uh, being trapped in, 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 a, in a severe crisis and if they uh, feel um, that the crisis is, is impacting their daily lives in growing poverty rates, growing unemployment rates, and so on and so forth. The third and last factor for, for the growing disenchantment of politics is the fact that politicians, and here I come to uh, differentiate between uh, government and opposition, uh, the third factor for the growing disenchantment is the fact that uh, politicians, uh, political parties have not been able to uh, agree on, uh, on a national agenda, to agree on a roadmap to transition Egypt to democracy. Uh, on January 20, 25, 2011, as Egyptians uh, took out to the streets to demonstrate against the despotic rule of uh, former President Mubarak, they were hoping that um, a national agenda, a roadmap of sorts, will emerge uh, with points of convergence and agreement between uh, religious right-wing parties, liberal parties, and liberal uh, and leftist parties. That has not been happening. So the third factor for disenchantment with politics and politicians is the fact that we have not been able to deliver with regard to agreeing on a, on a, on a roadmap, on a national agenda, how to transition Egypt to democracy and how to tackle the different questions which are related to that. And let me put as a caveat that it's not easy to agree on a national agenda. It's not easy to transition to democracy. If democracies are messy, functioning democracies are messy, uh, as you all know, in the US and elsewhere, transitions <coughs> to democracy are even messier. <laughs> transitions to democracy are even more tough mm -hmm. on, on, on societies to tackle and to, uh, to manage. But we have that growing disenchantment, and those are the key factors. Uh, growing signs of ungovernability, failure to address uh, people's demands in the day-to-day -day management of politics, and lacking a national agenda. Third, third factor is, and here I differentiate between government and opposition, and of course when I refer to government, I'm referring to the government of the elected president, President Mohamed Morsi, who is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and who used to be um, uh, the president of the Freedom and Justice Party, and the Freedom and Justice Party continues to be the strongest party in terms of its representation in the existing legislative council, the consultative council. And when I refer to the opposition, I'm referring to a variety of liberal leftists, uh, as well as uh, some religious right-wing parties as well, quite a diverse spectrum. Now, the government um, uh, is, and the reference is to the last 10 months, since July 1st, 2012, the day on which the presidential term began up until now. The government, government performance is characterized by uh, three facts. 
Uh, number one is, to my mind, um, um, an inefficient uh, handling of social and economic uh, issues. Secondly, an attempt to control state institutions and not to rationalize and reform state institutions. And thirdly, um, departing from early promises to build national consensus and to agree on, on, on a roadmap into uh, a mode of uh, hegemony building, of dominating Egyptian politics. On, 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 on inefficiency, I believe, um, if I'm not sure whether you are following Egyptian uh, politics or not, but if you look at um, the performance of the existing government, of the cabinet, of the presidential team, I believe that Egyptians are not being given what they deserve in terms of tackling core social and economic uh, issues. Secondly, with regard to controlling and not reforming the state in any country which is transi transitioning to democracy after decades of autocracy, the state bureaucracy needs to be reformed. There are reform uh, projects which need to be put forward and promoted, introducing the impartiality of public service, introducing accountability and governance measures, introducing transparency. All of that continues to be lacking two years after the revolution or 10 months into the presidential term of the elected uh, president. Uh, thirdly, and against earlier promises by the Muslim Brotherhood, which promised at the beginning not to run, not to field a candidate in the presidential elections in order not to dominate uh, Egyptian politics, which promised after the president was elected, the existing president, Dr. Mohamed Morsi, who once again is a member uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood and used to, to head its party, or the party, the movement established, against promises to put forward National, national consensus and national dialogue, uh, not much has been, uh, has been offered uh, in reality. And what we are seeing is an attempt to take Egyptian politics in a direction which is, to my mind, substantially uh, undemocratic. Uh, clearly, the ballot box is being respected. The results of the ballot box are being respected. Islamists, uh, the Muslim Brothers talk a great deal about institution building, and I see where they are coming from. But whatever else belongs to democracy in terms of democratic procedures and values, building consensus and including opposition movements and creating a space uh, room of maneuvering for different political actors to exist and to, to, to share responsibility, it's not out there. The opposition, and I'm going to end uh, on that note, final and my, my fourth and last point, the opposition is not uh, free of, uh, of mistakes. Uh, I, I, I believe, and I'm generalizing, and of course I'm, I'm, I'm offering some self-criticism as well, since I'm uh, acting within the opposition spectrum, um, in, 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 in a front uh, which was recently established by the name of the National Salvation Front, composed of different liberal and leftist and nationalist parties. The opposition is not free of mistakes. I believe the opposition committed several mistakes in the last 10 months, in the last two years. Let me name uh, four of them very briefly and end on, uh, on, a, on, on a positive note. The four mistakes are, number one, the opposition was willing to, uh, not to compromise, but did not appreciate the value of building institutions to transition to democracy. Countries do not succeed to transition to democracy if they do not have strong and viable institutions. <coughs> and even if we have some doubts about the legality, the constitutionality of institutions, it's always good to have an institution than not to have an institution. Um, and that was not appreciated by the opposition. Secondly, um, the opposition uh, did not do a proper job in putting forward suggestions as to agree on a roadmap as well. So it was not only missing or lacking on the side of the governing Muslim Brotherhood, it was missing on the side of the opposition as well. Thirdly, the opposition did for a long time fall into the trap of playing politics in a very conventional uh, manner, which really does not correspond to people's needs. Uh, opposition leaders uh, used to and continue to do that. In fact, sit in closed rooms, issue statements, uh, announce statements in front of TV cameras, and that's it. That is not the way you do proper constituency uh, outreach activities. You do proper constituency building. You reach out to people to convince them uh, um, uh, by what you are pushing forward. Finally, the opposition is yet to shape an alternative. And of course, I'm not generalizing 
uh, and by asking the opposition, liberal, leftist, and far religious right wing to offer a joint alternative, but at least each one, each component of the opposition spectrum should offer an alternative on social, economic, and political issues and try to convince Egyptians uh, that, that that is a more efficient and viable, com uh, viable alternative as opposed to what the government is putting forward. To end on a positive uh, note, Against that background, against the disenchantment of, uh, of Egyptians, uh, and against different troubling signs, uh, including uh, sectarian tensions, including um, um, growing, um, um, growing violence in, 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 in different uh, urban and rural areas, against that background, we have um, a vibrant public space. We have a public space which is debating politics increasingly in a rational uh, manner, moving beyond uh, that obsession with high politics, with the constitution, with election-related uh, issues, and pushing politicians and parties <laughs> to deliver on the day-to-day -day management of their lives, asking about what are you going to do socially, what are you going to do economically, and that rationalization of the public space <laughs> and the diversity of actors taking place, young Egyptians, peop people organized in parties, people not organized in parties, different protest movements, that vibrant public space is the one hope which we continue to have in a moment which is difficult socially, economically, and politically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamzawi. Dr. Ate. Okay, thank you, Joshua. Ch thank you for coming, joining us, and thank you for uh, being interested in uh, Egypt and Egyptian politics. Uh, three years ago, some hungry and uneducated Egyptians went to streets demonstrating and asking for food and jobs. Okay. Three years ago, some of Hungary and uneducated Egyptians went to streets demonstrating and asking for, foods, uh, for food and jobs. Some of the oppositions working against country used those <coughs> innocent, young, needly Egyptians to step down President Mubarak, who was freely stepped down minimi to minimize losses may happen among protesters. The political parties and groups ruled uh, country in the period, in this three, this three uh, years period, were remotely directed from other countries working to fall down Egypt. No social justice was implemented. More poverty, less education, they even sold Egypt assets. Finally, the Egyptians realized that President Mubarak was a wise man and a great, lead and a great leader who protected the country from those traitors. They set Mubarak free, Egyptians of course, and apologized uh, to him, begging him to rule again. President Barak sent all these leftist liberals and Islamic leaders to jail, but refused to rule again. He said people wanted change, and he should, we should implement the, their needs, and assigned President Gamal Mubarak for the presidency as a change towards the people's demands. This is the scenario. Some of us are uh, is very afraid to happen, and all of us are sure, we are all sure, that the counter-revolution in, in Egypt is working on it and working hard. This will never happen. What happened in 2011 is irreversible, as Dr. Khaled said uh, this morning, it is irreversible. Why I'm sure? I'm quite sure. Egyptians went to streets 25th of January asking for bread, means money and jobs, freedom, social justice. Suddenly, we all became quite sure this will never happen unless we get free, we get, we free Egypt first. We have to, uh, we had to free Egypt from dictatorship to get our needs, to get our demands. 28th, we changed, we changed the slogan into people, Shab, you read, people who want to step down the regime and the Mubarak 
must leave. How I am she? This what we said all together. Guess what? We weren't hungry and jobless. Most of us are highly educated, have jobs, some are businessmen. We were after Egypt, not ourselves. A lot of Egyptians died for this cause, for this cause, and much more are willing to die for the same cause. Egyptians will never let it happen. Will never let it happen with us or without us, with our help or without or without our help. We have challenges, yes. We have economical and political challenges. And Dr. Hamza, we said a lot of the challenges we, we are facing. We have advantages, yes. We have a lot of advantages. We had achievements, yes. Not quite a lot, but we have achievements. Still, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It is there. Still having long trip together, yes, but we should be together to arrive. By the end of the day, we will do it. And what is do it? What is it? We thought, and allow me to be a little biased, but Egyptians are all biased to Egypt. We taught the humanity how civilizations 7,000 years ago. We taught them how to start, or how to stand peacefully against injustice and severe power. And we will teach the world how a great nation is Egypt. And how we will lead again. We used to be leaders, and we will lead again. And provide civilization to the world, new concept of civilization. We did it when we picked up Egypt, rather than picking up sides, as Dr. Sullivan said the first day we were here. We did it in Tahrir Square. We did it several times ago. And we will do it again. What if we didn't do it? Egyptians will step us down and pick up others, and they will do it. But Egypt, we will do it. Egypt will do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atea.